Well, as a preacher, I find that almost nothing inspires me more than hearing a good preacher preach a good sermon on a good biblical text. I had that experience a year ago on Easter Sunday morning. As you may have heard, it's our tradition to have a sunrise service out in Rittenhouse Square. Last year, unfortunately, the weather was inclement. We were here in this sanctuary, and my friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Tripp, was preaching on the tragic reality of death and our desperate hope for eternal life. I believe he may have mentioned the text I'm taking for my text today because I was inspired by by the sermon so much so that I began taking a few notes, and before I knew it, I had an outline for Good Friday and for Easter Sunday 2009. I don't usually have a whole outline a year in advance, uh, but this year I did. What I intend to do is preach, then, a pair of sermons on the same biblical text A very simple text that encapsulates, I think, the whole message of Good Friday and Easter Sunday about as clearly and simply as any text in the Bible. It speaks to the reality of death, and thus it helps us to understand the death that Jesus died on the cross. It also testifies to the hope of life, and therefore it helps us understand the life that Jesus brought with him out of the grave. If you want to see the text, it's there before you in your bulletin, or you might also turn there in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. It goes like this, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a familiar text. One that many people know. I know that uh, many, maybe most, of the children and young people of 10th Church know it because it's part of our Bible memory program that we use in the Sunday school. Today I want to speak about just the first part of the verse. If you want to hear about the rest of the verse, you'll have to come back on Easter Sunday. But today I want to prove this very simple proposition and show its implications, not just for Good Friday, but for the salvation of humanity And that proposition is simply this, the wages of sin is death. Wages are the result of work. They are the things that someone deserves in return for the things that someone does. Sin is anything contrary to the will of God, including both the things that people do that God says they shouldn't, and also the things that people don't do that God says they should. And so what are the results of people doing what they shouldn't and not doing what they should do? Well, what we deserve for that is very simple. The Bible says it very clearly, the wages of sin is death. The first way I want to prove that proposition is from God's own words, starting in the very first pages of the Bible with the story of Adam and Eve. You may remember that God had put our first parents, Adam and Eve, in a beautiful garden, the Garden of Eden, and this he had planted them there by his grace. And God had given them a clear and very simple command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They could certainly eat from all of the other trees in the garden, but not from this particular tree, a command designed to test their obedience and also, I think, to teach Adam and Eve to find their satisfaction in God himself rather than in all of their earthly blessings. And when God gave this command not to eat from that tree, he also told them what would happen if they did. In the day you eat of it, God said, you shall surely die. And when he said die, he was talking about death in its most comprehensive sense, not merely about physical death, although that was part of it, but also about spiritual and eternal death. The person who sins will be cut off from the life of God and separated from him forever, an eternal death. And God was true to that word. After Adam had sinned by eating the forbidden fruit, God pronounced a curse against him, a curse that would lay Adam and all of his children down in the dust of death. God said, dust you are, and to the dust you shall return. 
as we often say, ashes to ashes and dust to dust, you see the wages of sin is death. This is very simply the word that God has spoken. We find it repeated other places in the Bible. I think, for example, of the prophet Ezekiel, the soul who sins shall die. That puts it very simply, doesn't it? Or think of the words of the Apostle Paul, people who practice wickedness deserve to die, not that it is our place to put them to death, but that according to the holy justice of God, this is what sinners deserve. And so the proposition is true, true because God said it is true. I will repeat it again, the wages of sin is death. But now there are other ways to prove that proposition. God's own word would be all the proof that we need, of course, but we can also prove the wages of sin, I think, from the example of various sinners in the Bible. Because as we read through the pages of the Old and New Testaments, we encounter many men and women who receive death as the wages of their sin. We see them sin, and then as the result of their sin, we also see them die. And maybe you could think of a few examples yourself. We certainly see it in the story of Noah and the Great Flood, for example. God had told Noah to build this enormous ark, a huge sailing vessel for the protection of his family and the propagation of the animal kingdom. And what made that necessary was the sin of humanity. God had looked down from heaven and he saw that the people he made were sinful The Bible says that God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And according to God's own holy justice, the wages of that sin had to be death. And so God said that he would send a great flood to judge them for their sins. That's exactly what happened. The whole human race destroyed except for Noah and his family, and all because of sin. We see the same thing in the story of Moses and the great escape. The people of God, you may remember, were slaves to Pharaoh. They were in bondage to Egypt. And this Pharaoh was a cruel and ruthless tyrant, seeking even to slaughter the babies of the Israelites. He refused to let the people of God serve God or worship God, and the wages of that sin was death. God sent a a series of ten dreadful plagues, death on the Nile, death from disease, death from the angel of death. Finally, Pharaoh decided to let God's people go, but no sooner had he let them go than he changed his mind. He chased them. He caught up with them at the Red Sea, but but God had a way of escape for his people. They walked through the sea on dry land, and immediately afterwards, when Pharaoh and his army tried to pursue them, God released the waters of the sea, and the Egyptians were carried down to a watery grave. The wages of their sin was death. And as we read through the Bible, we see the same thing happen to many individuals. We see it happen, for example, in the story of Nadab and Abihu, the the sons of Aaron, two of the first priests of Israel. They were holy priests, and so their holy responsibility was to go into the holy sanctuary of God and offer holy sacrifice. Yet very foolishly, they decided to worship God the way that they pleased rather than the way that God pleased. And they, when they went into the house of God, they offered some unholy fire of sacrilegious worship. And what happened to them as a result? Well, by now you should know the wages of their sin was death. In fact, God did not even want their bodies to be touched. They were dragged out of the tabernacle on blankets and taken outside of the camp. We see something similar happen to Goliath, the giant, who taunted the armies of Israel and spoke in defiance of their God. And for that blasphemy, Goliath was struck down with a single stone hurtled from the slingshot of David. You see, the wages of Goliath's sin was death. We see it happen, if I can give yet another example, to greedy King Ahab and his wicked queen, the proud and crafty Jezebel. Perhaps you know this story, that Ahab desperately wanted to get his hands on a vineyard that was near his palace, and when the owner refused to sell it, Queen Jezebel devised a way for him to get it. 
She arranged for the vineyard's owner to be accused of some capital crime that he never committed, and the man eventually was put to death. Ahab went to claim the vineyard for himself, but by the time he got there, the prophet Elijah was already there, there to announce the wages of his sin. Elijah prophesied that Ahab would be slain in battle and that both he and his wife, their bodies, would be thrown out and eaten by scavengers. And that is exactly what happened because, you see, the wages of sin is death. There are so many examples, it would be impossible to mention them all. I think further of Absalom, that son who rebelled against his father David. He opposed the rightful king of God's people. Well, Absalom was caught in a tree by his long tresses of hair, and he was run through with a sword. Or think of Haman. There's justice for you. He tried to kill Mordecai and all of the other Jews in Persia. He ended up swinging from the very gallows that he had built for his enemy. The list goes on and on. Think of Sisera. Think of Uzzah. Think of Adonijah. And if you don't know who they are, you can look it all up in the pages of the Bible. These are all men struck dead by God and thus receiving the wages of their sin. And those are just examples from the Old Testament. There are also a number of notable examples from the New Testament. I think, for example, of King Herod, who loved to have people tell him that he was a god, and yet his golden robes could not protect him from the angel of the Lord who struck him down. And we are told that this proud king was eaten by worms and died. Or think of Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to the church and lied to God about how much they put in the offering plate. Both husband and wife were struck dead at the very doorstep of the church. I tell you, the wages of sin is death. But now, when the Bible says this, it is not just talking about the spectacular sinners, the infamous sinners who, who died as the result of some direct act of divine vengeance. The Bible is also talking about all of the ordinary sinners who die in ordinary ways at the end of their days. Why is it that people die instead of living forever? It is because we are part of a sinful race. It is because we inherit a sinful nature from Adam, the first sinner. And it is because we ourselves sin in countless ways, and the wages of that sin also is death. We heard it in the verses that were read for us earlier from Romans chapter 5. Sin came into the world through one man, meaning Adam, and death through sin, meaning initially, first of all, the death of Adam himself, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And when we read the long lists of names in the Bible, those genealogies that make for such fascinating reading, we should consider what these names tell us about the human condition. The names in those long biblical lists certainly do a lot of begetting. So-and-so begat so-and-so, and and he begat so-and-so, on and on it, it goes. But those people also did a lot of dying. Where is Methuselah today? Where is his son Lamech? What about Jeconiah and Shealtiel and Zerubbabel? All dead and buried. And so really, everywhere we turn in the Bible, not just to this place or that place, we find another proof of our proposition that the wages of sin is death. I've tried to show this from the direct words of God himself. From the example of many sinners in the stories of the Bible, you see, proving it both from the words of God and from the works of God, his acts of divine judgment, You know, it might also be possible to prove this from personal experience, from life and from death as we know it, what happens in the world around us. Sometimes people die just the way that they should. And so, for example, when a murderer who attacks an innocent victim gets murdered himself, justice has been served. The wages of his sin proves to be death. Or when 
someone engages in foolish and reckless behavior and is fatally injured as a result, that person ends up getting what he or she deserves. There is that kind of justice that we sometimes see in the world around us. But I'm not just talking, again, about the spectacular sins of notorious sinners. I'm talking about the whole human race with all of our petty iniquities from the mean little remarks that we make just to make us look a little better and someone else a little bit worse to, for example, the music that we steal from an illegal download, some little sin like that, and all of the other sins that make us small. No one is righteous. No, not even one of us. And it is for this reason that death has come into the world. Who can deny the painful reality of death? Perhaps to this point in life, you have been fortunate enough not to lose anyone close to you. But if that is the case, it is only a matter of time. And if it has happened to you before, you know that it will happen to you again. You will gather, perhaps, around the deathbed of a family member. Or you will weep at the funeral of someone you love. You will stand beside a cold grave. Or else the time will come when you are confronted with your own mortality and you realize that you too are a person who someday will die. And when you deal with death, always remember this, that it is the wages of sin. That the reason there is death in the world is because there is sin in the human heart. But now if that proposition is true, if the wages of sin is death, as I have tried to show, then what sense can you make of the death of Jesus Christ? Now, Good Friday is the day when we remember his crucifixion, which I believe is the most important event in human history, or maybe I should say one of the two most important events in human history, if you want to include not only the crucifixion of Jesus, but also his resurrection. And the historical records show all of them, both the ones inside and some of the ones outside of the Bible, that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was put to death in the Roman way, in the Roman manner of criminal execution. He was nailed to a wooden cross and then left to die. And if the wages of sin is death, then naturally we would assume that Jesus deserved to die that in some way he was implicated in this problem of sin. After all, he died as a common criminal. In fact, the Romans reserved crucifixion for the very worst criminals. It was for the lowest of the low. And so one might expect, therefore, that Jesus was guilty of some great crime like murder or treason or one of the kinds of crimes that that crucifixion was usually reserved for. And yet the record of the case shows that exactly the opposite is true. Jesus went through a series of trials, both Jewish and Roman, and in each case it proved extraordinarily difficult for his enemies to prove any accusation against him. At the end of his Jewish trials, there was a sort of vague accusation of blasphemy, but if the charge against Jesus was that he was the Son of God, well, he was the Son of God. And so in the end, he was condemned for being who he actually was, the divine Son of God. The Romans had even more trouble with Jesus. The the judge in the Roman trial was Pontius Pilate, and one of the strangest things about that trial is how many times Pilate found Jesus innocent of all charges. You read through the record of the trial, and you keep hearing Pilate saying things like this, I find no guilt in this man. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. And yet at the end of it all, Pilate sentenced Jesus to death anyway, but that could not change the fact that he was innocent of all charges. In fact, we heard it from the Gospel of Luke, the part of the Gospel that was read earlier. There's a man at the cross that says, certainly this man was innocent. And so when he was crucified, therefore, it was not the wage for any crime that he had done. And we can go farther than that. We can say that Jesus did not die for his own sin at all. Sooner or later, every mortal dies, and for the rest of us, this is no less than we deserve. All of us have that sinful nature that we have inherited from Adam, and all of us sin in many ways, every day in fact. 
And so there's a sense in which death for us is always the wages of sin, even if we're not struck dead for any particular sin. Death is still what we deserve for our sin. And yet we cannot apply that principle to Jesus because he never sinned. Not only was he innocent of all of the charges that were brought against him in his trial, but he was innocent of any and all charges whatsoever. Jesus Christ is the sinless Son of God. Having been conceived by the Holy Spirit, he did not inherit the guilt of a sinful nature from Adam, nor did he ever commit any actual sins. The Bible often describes Jesus as the righteous one or the holy one in the superlative sense. It says that Jesus was a human being just like us, sharing the flesh of our humanity, yet without sin. It says that Jesus committed no sin, that he never did. Now, why then was Jesus crucified? If the wages of sin is death, but Jesus did not sin, how then could he be put to death? And the answer is that Jesus must have been receiving the wages for someone else's sin. It was for you. It was for me that Jesus bore the wages of sin. You see, on the cross, a transaction was taking place, Jesus taking our sin upon himself. The Bible says this in a variety of different ways. It says that the iniquity of us all was laid on him. It says that the one who knew no sin, that is Jesus, was made To be sin, that is because the guilt of our sin was being put on him. And once that transaction had taken place, once our sin was put over onto Jesus, then it was necessary for Jesus to die. Remember what we have been saying, the wages of sin is death. And if you want the proof of that proposition, maybe the clearest place to see it is on Calvary. On the first Good Friday, when Jesus was crucified... You see, when our sin was put over onto Jesus, there was only one thing that could happen to him then. Jesus had to die. And this is how deadly sin is. Put sin over onto a perfect man. Put the guilt of that sin over onto the very Son of God himself. And I tell you, that man will die. As a matter of divine justice, there is nothing else that can happen to him. He will and he must die. And so the cross is, you might say, the ultimate proof that the wages of sin is death. You can prove it from the words of God. You can prove it from examples all the way through the Bible. Maybe you can even prove it from your own experience of life and death in the world, but you can certainly prove it at the cross. Because there you see Jesus dying, dying for sin, dying for idolatry and theft and murder and adultery dying for for every kind of bad sin that people ever commit, and not just for the sins that we tend to think of as bad. Jesus died for any and every sin, including all of the little sins that nevertheless deserve death from a holy God. When those sins, all of our sins, were put over onto Jesus, he paid their wages by dying to the very death. That is what you see when you look at the cross. You see the wages of sin, that it is death. But now when you look to the cross, you also see the hope of salvation. Because in addition to seeing what sin deserves, you also see that sin has been dealt with. The wages of sin must be paid, including the wages of our own sin. And you can pay the wages for yourself if you wish, And if you do, then surely you will die, not just a physical death, but also the spiritual and eternal death that follows that everlasting separation from God. Or you can do this. You can confess those sins. You can put them over onto Jesus. You can ask Jesus to take care of those sins on your behalf. You can ask him to pay the wages that you deserve. And if you do ask him to do that, he will do it. And so I have been trying today to prove a very clear and simple proposition that the wages of sin is death. 
And I want to leave you at the end with a very clear and simple choice, a kind of choice of payment options, if you want to think about it that way. That either you can pay the wages of your own sin, or you can ask Jesus to pay them on your behalf. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life is offered to you in Jesus Christ. Which choice will you make? Our Father in heaven, we give you praise for this free gift, the free gift of eternal life. We give you praise that someone else has stepped forward to pay the wages of our sin. And we pray that you would give us the faith to believe in this Savior. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.